Welcome to this Visco Creator Session. My name is John Sly. I'm the curator here at Visco. I'll be hosting today, and I'm very honored and excited to welcome Zoe Casper, uh, because for the past, I feel like, four or five years, I've been seeing Zoe's work and curating it, and all of us have been fascinated by how she composes scenes and creates just like moments that make me stop and think about what's going on here in a really new and exciting way. Um, so I can't wait for her to talk about her practice at length today to kind of show how she goes about finding these moments and um, just also giving us some hidden secrets of how good she is at flash photography. So I'm really excited about this. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Zoe to take it away. Zoe, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, John, for the introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And yeah, thanks to everyone for joining. I'm um, really excited to talk to you all today. So let's get started. Um, so also thank you to Visco as well. Like I, I'm, yeah, I'm just very, very blessed to be here. And um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna to talk to you today a little bit about my journey with photography up until now. Um, and then I'm gonna get into a little bit about finding your creative potential and share with you how I found mine as well. And then after that, we're gonna talk about my favorite subject, which is flash photography. And then we'll get into a Q and A. So, um, so yeah, let's go. <laughs> I'm from Seattle, Washington. Um, but I'm actually now based in the Netherlands. I've lived here for about five years now. Um, and I have been using Visco since around 2014. Um, and that was right around the time when I started to take photography more seriously. Um, so I feel like it's really cool. Like it's been there with me since the very beginning. And um, I, I'm thankful to have it to also look back on like how far I've come in the past like eight, eight, almost 10 years. To start off, my sort of first experience or introduction into photography was actually through my family's photo albums. And um, yeah, I remember like, it was one of my biggest hobbies as a kid, just going through all the family photos. And um, some of the, the photos that stuck out to me the most were from my great grandmother. Um, and they really left an impression on me because I saw things that like everyday items would change so much over time. Like for example, on the photo on the top, right, the swimming suits are just so different than they look like today. And, um, on the left, the top left, there's a speed limit sign that says 12 miles per hour on the side of the road. And like, you, you just wouldn't see a speed limit that low in this day and age. And you know, you don't think about those mundane objects and how much over time they change. So I remember that kind of inspired me to start documenting my own life. Um, and that just started with just writing in journals or um, yeah, saving letters from friends or, or little keepsakes. Um, and eventually that grew into taking photos with my, my little cell phone camera or my little point and shoot camera. Um, and yeah, eventually grew into my, my photography. Um, I also grew up in the suburbs and I remember like not feeling very inspired by, by my environment there, but I was really into fantasy books, especially Harry Potter. That was like my life back then when I was a kid. And um, yeah, I think these stories really sparked my imagination and I was trying to find the magic in everyday life. We can go to the next. Um, so also both of my dads always had a camera on them. Um, my stepdad on the left is, he's like the, the gadget king and he has, um, yeah, he's always had all these camera gadgets. Like in this picture, he has this super, um, super long selfie stick with like a 360 GoPro on the top. Um, so that's his current, his current gadget. Um, and my dad on the right always had a camera on him as well. Um, he, he had um, um, a lot of film cameras when I was younger, I remember. And he would do um, a lot of black and white film photography. 
before switching to digital. So um, I think, yeah, photography is like ingrained in me because of them. Um, so yes, I'm curious, did he give you your first film camera? No, he didn't because he, he switched to di digital uh, like probably back in the early 2000s. So, so yeah, I didn't. I didn't get them, but um, yeah, I'm a little salty about that. But uh, <laughs> you know, that's okay. First, a digital camera in college, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I then moved on to this next point in my journey, which was um, um, when I went to college, I took my first photography course. So this at this point, I'm learning like how to actually work a camera, how to work a DSLR. Um, and I started going on fo photo walks um, and there was this place in the Palouse, Washington, where my university is, is located. Um, and I would go here because the sunset was so beautiful, setting over the hills and um, the colors would just, yeah, the colors would pop. I love the color palette of the sunset. And um, I felt like this, at this point, I had learned how to use my camera. And I remember I was able to capture the colors and the scenery, just how I saw it with my own eye. And yeah, so at that time I felt like my camera became more of a tool to me and it was more an, um, like more of an extension of my eye. And at this point on, I became like completely hooked with, with, with photography. I mean, I always had a camera on me. Um, nice. So yeah, and we can go to the next. Um, this photo, um, was um, the next pivotal point for me, which was when I bought my first analog camera. So um, when I graduated college, I was working in retail and I was really craving like having more creativity in my life. And um, I was also craving to learn more about photography. Um, so I went out and bought this camera it was a Minolta X700 actually, which is still one, yeah, one of my favorite cameras ever. It's amazing, um, I really recommend it. But I took this camera with me on a hike with friends and um, it was <laughs> Minolta gang, somebody popped up. Yes, true, Minolta gang. Um, and we basically, my friends and I went on this hike um, to Mount Rainier National Park. And we were all the way, um, at the top of the mountain and the clouds cleared and I snapped this photo and um, I didn't know what I was gonna get because yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't really used the camera yet, but I went back after the hike and, and got my film developed and I got this back and I was just so blown away by like the tones and the colors and just the overall feeling and excitement of getting your film back. It feels like Christmas and and yeah, that, at that point I was hooked on analog photography and I, I never went back to digital. Mm. Love it. Yeah. Okay, and then here we are at the next point. So about five years later, um, I was working in an office position and um, I was still doing photography in, in all of my free time. Um, and ever since I graduated college, I was applying for creative jobs. You know, I was trying to get my foot in the door as a photographer, but I had been rejected because of lack, lack of experience. Um, and, you know, I really knew at this moment, like I really needed to make a change, which I'll tell you about later. But first that change really came from, and we can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, Part of that change was really diving further into my personal practice. And I really, um, yeah, I really just gave it my all. And I think this is how my personal work is evolving now. Um, I'm starting to really develop a, a certain look and feel and I wanna share it with you. So finding your creative potential. Um, I studied art in college and a teacher once told me that actually every piece of art that you make or every piece of work that you make um, or have made in the past is connected in some way with like a red line, you can imagine it. So when this teacher told me that, 
you know, I hadn't, I hadn't taken many photos yet, but um, it struck me. It really struck me as like, wow, I, I wonder what that is. And I, yeah, I didn't know what exactly that red line was for me, but I knew it was my, my duty to try and uncover it. So um, that's what I went about doing. We can go to the next slide. Um, I think over the past 10 years of shooting, it's becoming a bit more clear to me of, of what that red line is. And this is a collage of photos. This is kind of what my brain feels like at all times, like just a total mess. But, um, but yeah, like a lot of common themes for me are um, nature. Also like on the opposite spectrum of that is like cityscapes. Um, lots of, I like shiny things, <laughs> I like to say. So, you know, sparkle, um, colors, lights, um, also everyday objects like the mundane, yes. um, and a theme I notice in my work a lot is, is solitude. So, um, I want to share with you all how you can go about finding this connection in your own work, this red line, um, and that can eventually lead to developing your own creative point of view. So... Let's start with the first tip, which is to revisit old work. Um, this is a video of my um, Visco feed from around like 2014. So at this time I was like really saturating everything. I was turning that saturation knob like all the way up to the top. And I was putting a lot of contrast in my photos, but I can see there, there's a lot of nature coming back. Um, this, these colors that are bright, I see it now even coming back into my work. So I already, it was already there to start off with. And now when I look back with fresh eyes, I can see the connection. So I really encourage you to do that as well with your own work. It can give you a, a fresh perspective. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing the solitude interest as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. It's, um, yeah, it definitely, I feel it in my own work as well. Yeah, it's, 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 um, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, perfect. Um, okay, so my next tip is to notice what you are drawn to and also inspired by and collect it and then re reproduce it. So you can really draw inspiration from other art forms. It, you, can, you know, it can be like movies, it can be sports, it can be sculpt sculpting or painting. It can be anything. And for me, it was really painting, actually. Um, I, I wanted to be a painter. Um, I guess, yeah, I still, I still do. It's still like an inspiration in the future, I guess. But um, for me, um, a specific um, period of painting that inspires me is, is called post-impressionism. And it's where artists of this time period really wanted to exaggerate um, what they were seeing. So they would use um, exaggerated colors and brush strokes to really get this otherworldly effect. Um, and I, I draw inspiration from this period in my own photos. So um, I think by noticing what you're drawn to, um, you can also start reproducing or like learning from the masters essentially. Um, and you can bring these techniques into your own practice and that can help you develop as well as an artist or as a photographer. Zoe, can I ask, I'm really curious. Um, I, I think I, I see the connections, especially with composition and colors, but the, what is from like the work here to what do you feel most drawn to? Like what kind of stuff do you feel like inspired to try and recreate in your own work? Um, well, I love making still lives. Yes. Um, because I feel like it's something I, I can do with everyday objects around in the house. Um, and post-impressionists really love to do that as well. Um, and I think, you know, I, of course I love being out in, in the nature, it, um, but yeah, I live in the Netherlands now and we it's pretty flat over here. We don't have a lot of mountains. So I've, I've got to search for that some other way. Um, so yeah, I think for me right now, I'm, I'm really interested in making still lives and seeing how I can bring um, different colors in into my work that way or different um, unique, um, yeah, unique, unique perspectives using still lives. Absolutely. Love it. Awesome. 
So. Yeah. Um, another um, source of inspiration for me is, is Japanese woodblock prints. Um, and post-impressionists were also inspired by these master printers. So um, yeah, this unlocked a whole another, another um, yeah, source of inspiration for me to bring back to my own work. And um, like, you can see the sparkle on the water there. And like these, um, this imagery was often a lot, a lot of times of nature. So um, yeah, it's, it's just really inspiring to see how they were, um, they were like using these incredible um, printmaking techni techniques to bring about this imagery. So um, yeah, it's also a source of inspiration for me. So I'm curious, you can throw it in the chat. Um, I would love to know what you are inspired by. Yeah, just what, what inspires you to make art or what inspires you to take photos. I'm seeing music, clouds. <laughs> ecology nice yeah. ocean that one gets me too yeah so many people are responding it's amazing memories i like that fantastic these could be good themes for uh project or feature spin what was that john this could be a great jumping off point to uh some work or a space to start collecting some of this imagery, if y'all. Yeah. Great. Nature, cinematic films, mundane spaces, me too. Yep. And space. I can't well, thank you sharing. as far as. There was an interesting question, uh, statement, Zoe, about someone like they can't figure out what inspires them. Did you ever feel like in a similar position around like kind of feeling stuck or in a rut? Definitely. Definitely. There was like for a long time, I, I wasn't sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, there's like something in my throat. Um, yeah, there was a, there was a, um, a lot of time, uh, a long period of time where I wasn't quite sure. And I guess how I. I um, had a breakthrough with that as I just, I just kept going. I just kept just, if, if I felt in a certain moment, like, oh, this, this thing I'm seeing is making me feel excited. I would take a photo of it. And over time, mm. like I'm starting to collect all these images. And then after that, you start to see, you start to see the connection. It does come through, but mm. sometimes, um, sometimes you just need to give it more time. All right. Excellent. Yeah, we can move on to um, the next um, tip. So my next tip for you all is to actually make mistakes. Um, <clears throat> mistakes can really become a part of your style. And it, it can also be seen as like a form of inspiration. Um, and it can lead to a breakthrough, which it, it did for me as well. Um, a lot of my photos are accidents. This one, for example, was I um, I dropped my camera like shortly after taking this photo and the back popped open and all the film came out and I was like, oh no, what happens? Like what, what what's gonna happen with the film is all ruined. And I got it back and it had this, you know, big light streak in it. And I actually thought it was ruined at the time. And I just set the photo aside and, and didn't, um, yeah, I really thought it was it was not a good photo. And then I think like six months later, I was looking back at my photos again from this day, and um, I saw it, and I and I thought, oh wow, this actually this actually looks kind of nice. I kind of like it. Mm. And I think from this mistake, I learned that you can like embrace the imperfection, and. Um, yeah, you can you can make these mistakes and it's okay. And um, yeah, it's just a part, a whole part of the process. You have to trust that process and you might end up somewhere interesting. Go to the next and- It was connected to what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, my next tip is to to make a lot of work essentially. So 
yeah, you, what helped me a lot is just to shoot more often. And, um, I think what helped me to shoot more often was I realized like, I want to make the photos for myself and not for other people. So it just was really honing in on the things that made me happy. And I didn't have to explain it to anyone else. Like it didn't have to make sense, but I just started making the things I wanted to make. Um, and I was also open to the exper experiment or the experience as well, um, because you really never know when the magic is going to like appear or happen like you you don't know what you're going to get when you bring your camera out like and that's kind of the beauty of it but if you're open to it like you know you were you're gonna you're gonna find something it's just it just will it will happen for you um and I think when I was first starting to shoot I would always wait until um I was going on a trip or like going somewhere new to a new country or something like a new city mm -hmm. and I was saving it for that. But then I started to realize like, I actually could just find, I could, I could, I don't need to be anywhere special. Like it could also just be with the sunlight that's coming through my window and it could be around the block and something is happening, you know, across the street. And so for example, in these photos, um, the, the photo on the left is just right outside my apartment door and the sunlight was was streaming down in between the building and I, the ladder was out in our hallway so and I there's a water jug we you know sitting there in our hallway as well I just grabbed it and thought like oh this might look nice together and I really loved how the photo turned out it, this is like a still life for me and um yeah maybe it doesn't make sense but I I think visually it looks interesting and um, the middle one is um, a double exposure, but it's just, I took it in my apartment. <clears throat> um, it's just a wine glass that I had. And um, then I took a, a double exposure of the sky. So it was all readily available for me to take just with things that I had around the house. And um, the, the picture on the right is just walking around my neighborhood and, um, looking at the different textures and yeah I really love tiles so I saw these tiles I was like yes this light is perfectly the sunlight's like cutting off the, the tiles perfectly so yeah just you know experimenting walking around you know looking around your house for for common items you don't have to be anywhere special just you know just make a lot of work for yourself and, and see what happens I'm curious shooting on analog um do you feel how do you approach that? Are you cautious with your role or do you try and take a lot of time with staging before deciding to take the shot? Or are you pretty generous with snapping lots of photos? I am pretty cautious. I've actually been trying to tell myself to, you know, let loose a little bit. Um, yeah. But yeah, I usually only take like one to two or three photos max mm. of, of like a certain subject. Cause I usually feel like when I'm shooting analog, it's funny. It's funny because when I'm shooting digitally, like yeah. for work or something, I shoot a ton of photos and I kind of don't know when to stop. But when I'm shooting with analog, it's like, I'm looking almost through a different lens and I really take the time to compose, but then I feel it. And I know that like this photo was the right one. So I actually don't even need to take another one. So yeah. that's why I actually, prefer shooting analog. This feels like a great moment to really be decisive about the things you're working on or trying to study in that yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Okay, we can go to the next. Um, so my next tip is, and my last tip for now, <clears throat> is to share with others. So this can come up in a lot of different forms. Um, it can be in portfolio reviews, for example, um, a lot of like associations or art galleries will even offer like free portfolio reviews. Sometimes teachers will do it for you. Um, but if you have somebody view your work, you can, um, get a, an outside perspective of, of how people 
are, are looking at your, um, your photos. And I think it's important just to, to gain that perspective. You don't have to, you don't have to, you know, believe it, but it's good just to, to see how people are, are, are viewing you, your work. You might learn something new about yourself. Um, and also you can share with others by posting online, like for example, on Visco. And for me, um, Visco was the first place actually that I became confident sharing my work. Like it felt like a safe space to be creative, mm -hmm. uh, be ex experimental. And I really love that about Visco. Um, I think um, another way you can also um, share with others is just to share with friends by like um, collaboration, for example. Um, and for example, like, um, with a friend, like a good friend of mine, um, I, she's actually on the chat. I saw her Elizabeth, but, um, I had never used flash before and we were going on shoots together and, um, she had, um, an external flash with her mm. and she let me borrow it. And yeah, it's because of that, that time together, I was able to like experiment with shooting this with this flash. And that's like when I became hooked on it, I was like in love with the look that it gave, <laughs> that it gave. Isn't it so, coming through, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, sharing with others is really important to, um, yeah, to basically get to that next step and give you some more perspective of your own work. What's some of the best advice that stuck with you the longest from sharing your work with others that you've heard from them? I think for me, um, it was really, um, that's a good question. I think for me, it was, um, for example, I did like a, I did a portfolio review at, um, at a local gallery and, um, I had kind of, I had printed off a lot of photos and I wasn't really, I didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest. I was just trying it out. Mm -hmm. And this, this person gave me feedback like, okay, it's looking great, but I need you to tell a little bit more of a story because mm -hmm. I'm seeing kind of the same image repeated over, which that's what I did. I showed like basically the same image, but different angles of the same image, but I didn't have any, anything more to that. So I think this person really taught me like, what am I trying to to tell with my photography and it's something I'm still I'm still working on to this day like how do I tell a story <clears throat> yeah um, but I, I love that piece of advice and I think yeah it, it helped me grow as um, a photographer as well let's talk about flash photography um, I have some to show and tell here um, so these are, I'm going to be speaking specifically about external flashes today. Um, I have a lot with me. You can see. No, just kidding. I don't know oh. how to do this. <laughs> um, but yeah, this, these are like my little children. Um, but <laughs> before, um, before I start with these, basically, I want to tell you that you can, you can really start simple with flash. It doesn't, you don't need to have the these guys quite yet, but you can start with your phone. You can start with like a disposable camera, for example. So um, if you have a disposable camera, just make sure you're charging the flash before every shot. Um, if you're using your phone, you just gotta, you know, turn it on, turn, go into the settings, turn it on for yourself. Um, you can also use it on like a point and shoot camera and they sometimes have built in or pop-up flashes and um, you can just, Usually they're automatic, so you just have to turn it on and then, um, yeah, start shooting with that. And, and don't be afraid to shoot during daylight. Um, I used to think you only needed to, um, to shoot with flash at nighttime, but you can also use it during daytime. So just experiment with it, with it and see what the effects are um, and if you like it. Um, and then after that, you can start um, your journey with, the external flashes. So yeah, I, I have found all of these on like eBay or um, yeah, the, the secondhand, they're all, they're all used. Um, and they're usually pretty cheap, which is nice um, because yeah, 
who doesn't love a, a yeah, a nice uh, vintage product that you can find for like a dollar. Um, yes. Um, so the funny thing about these though, is that they have, so in this one, this is the Minolta. And if you can see here, there's like a dial. And this dial is, it has a bunch of numbers on it. Um, now these are called guide numbers. And this is like a standardized way of how to compose your, your exposure to get the right flash. And there's this other rule called the inverse square law, which is like this crazy rule that I, I, I mean, I've tried to learn with this rule and I just, it's not helpful to me at all. It sounds like gibberish. Um, so I'm going to share with you how I learned and how I tried to make it easier for myself to learn, to learn flash, because it, it is kind of complicated with the lighting and how to expose properly. So I'll, I'll share, um, a little recipe for you in a little bit. Um, but first let's go to the next slide and I'll kind of tell you the first step. Um, so what you're going to want to do first is um, find your sync speed of your camera. Mm. And um, every camera has a different sync speed. And basically the sync speed is just um, the, the fastest shutter speed which your camera can successfully process the flash. So um, most cameras are around, like Minolta X700 is 1 60th of a second. Um, but um, yeah, you're gonna wanna find that out. It's usually in your camera manual. And if you don't have the manual, you can always Google your camera model and it will come up. I've always found mine um, that way. And then um, this picture here actually is an example of what happens if you shoot with um, a sync speed that's faster than your camera. Um, so, what happens is you'll get this black bar, like your photo will actually turn black, um, partially black. Um, but going back to mistakes, like I kind of actually like how this photo turned out because even though I shot at the wrong sync speed, um, I like how the it looks like the light is illuminating the building perfectly where that where that black comes off. Up. So I yeah, it worked out right for this picture, right? So, so good. Um, I love the silhouette, yeah. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, so find your sync speed and the next step. And this is how I learned is to um, start shooting with TTYL. So I had a Minolta X 700. And so I bought, um, a Minolta flash that was compatible with the camera mm -hmm. and TTYL is basically, um, an automatic setting that composes the, the flash exposure for you. Um, now this is kind of like, it's kind of similar to shooting in like aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode. Um, and I think it's a really good way to, to learn just to start getting comfortable with, with the results that you're getting back. Um, so, and that's what I did. I was shooting with that for quite some time. And then I moved on to the next slide. Um, well, which is, which is manual flash. So I'm gonna give you the recipe in a minute of how I would compose. But I first wanted to show you um, two pictures of the same scene with and without flash. So um, the photo on the left is natural lighting. It's really warm and soft. Um, and um, the photo on the right is with flash and you can see the colors are totally popping differently. So there's, you can see on the radiator or the heater there, it's, um, it's really blue and the chair is orange. And um, yeah, it is a stylistic effect and it depends on what you're trying to gain from the scenery. But this is just to show you the comparison um, of what yeah. you can get with, with the flash. I, and- I, I just wanted to say, I'm thinking back to the paintings you showed earlier of like how vibrant those colors are. And it seems like flash just got you right into that spectrum. Yeah, it, it did. It really, it was finally giving me those, that pop of colors that I was looking for. Um, mm. And it, it really, um, yeah, it really just, it gives me that vibrance that I'm, I'm looking for. So Holy. fabulous. Um, this is my 
flash recipe for the scene. So, um, so this is what I do. I will set the shutter speed to the camera sync speed. And then I expose for the background. So usually what that looks like with film is that I am exposing for the, sh the shadows because the highlights you can really save, but you mm -hmm. wanna make sure that the, the shadows are not too dark. So I'm exposing for the shadows in the background, um, but I will then underexpose by about one half to one stop. And that's because I'm adding light back into the photo. So I don't want it to be too overexposed with the light that I'm adding in. So that's why I'm underexposing. And while I'm exposing the scene, I am also in my mind assessing the, the distance um, to the subject. So if I'm really close up, um, it's gonna be different than if the, if the subject is like really far away from me. So um, next what I do is I have my flash and there's different power settings. So you can example shoot at one over one or you can stop it down all the way to like 1 16th, for example. So if a subject is really close, I find that somewhere between like 1 8th to 1 4th power is really good happy medium. So you're not blowing out the subject, mm -hmm. but if they are far away, you know, I can go all the way up to like one half, maybe to um, full power as well. Um, so yeah, it does depend on how far they are away, but I think this is a really easy way to just remember like, okay, expose like I'm exposing the picture normally, but just remember to underexpose by one stop, then how close are you to the subject? Okay, if they're close to you, like right next to you, just, just stop the power down a little bit. And if they're far away, push it up. That's all you have to do. And feel free to screenshot this if, if you want. Um, so you can, you can remember it and take it back to your own practice. Um, but yeah, for me, that simplified it because if you read these like inverse square law rules, it just doesn't make sense. So um, yeah, I like to use this instead. We can go to the next slide and I'll show you um, another example of like the same, it, this is the same place, a little bit different background, like just shifted to the red a little bit, but um, the left image is more of a silhouette, um, which could also be a stylistic choice, but the right image, I, um, I use flash to, to make sure the, the pillars like were filled in. I wanted to get that fill in look. And so for the, their distance, did you bump the flash up in terms of power? Yeah, because I was, um, there was actually a line of people that I kind of worked my way around. Mm. Um, like this is like a, yeah, it was, so it was a little bit far away. It was, so I had to go around some people and um, I couldn't actually access this building. It was, I was shooting from outside of the building. So I did bump my flash up all the way here because I knew I needed all that power to, to illuminate the, the columns. Then I wanted to show you just the final editing touches that I would do. Um, and I usually do this for, for almost, yeah, for almost every picture. Um, so the video on the right, you can see, I'm, you can kind of see the before and after. So uh, this is before, this is after. So what I like to do is, um, I like to bring down the contrast just a little bit. I think flash already gives you a, a lot of contrast in the, in the shadows. And so I, I just bring down the contrast a little bit. I go into the toning and I um, bring up the shadows and bring the highlights down, which is also kind of the same as bringing down the contrast as well. Um, and then I will go into temperature sometimes. Um, sometimes I, I tend to like a warmer photo. So um, sometimes my photo is too, co too cool. And so I will actually bump up the temperature a bit. Um, and yeah, um, the tint as well. Like I like to, there was a period of time where I, like I was even like, I, I really liked magenta in my photos. So I was adding a lot of um, pink or bumping the, the tint up to pink instead of green. Mm. And uh, 
yeah, I do that. I kind of do that still just a little bit less than what I used to. Um, but yeah, this is what I, this is how I uh, make a final image with flash. Now we can go into all the creative uses of flash, the wonderful world out there. So um, we can go to the next slide, please. Mm. So first of all, you can use flash to really pop the colors. Um, you can get a lot of jewel tones out with, with, um, with flash and even neon colors, I would say. They are, they pop, they're popping. Um, so uh, that's what I love about flash. It's um, yeah, really for that, that color quality. Okay, we go to the next slide. Um, another thing I love to use flash for is for framing. Um, it can illuminate the foreground around your subject. And sometimes I even like, I will try to like place myself and something in between myself and the subject to try and create an interesting framing. And then when the light flashes on it, it yeah, it adds this other dimension to the photo. Um, so I think you can be very experimental with framing with flash. And actually, I have to go back just a real, real sec. Um, we were talking yesterday a little bit about composition, and you had a really great quote from another professor on with his advice as well with that um, in terms of picking your your framing and composition. Can you, yeah. Can you share a about that? Yeah. Well, my my professor actually he told me um he said don't put your subject in the middle of the frame as a rule. Just don't do it. And um, I said, actually, um, I was following that rule for quite some time, but then I actually was like, wait, why, why am I doing this? Because I like it, I wanna do it, I wanna break the rules. I was feeling, you know, um, like a rule breaker. So I started shooting a lot with uh, my subject in the middle. And I think it, it does draw your eye into the photo and it, it allows you to play with the framing. I, and I love the look of it uh, to the point where I actually, I probably do it too much now and I'm trying to, to break that habit mm. um, and, you know, go in a different direction. But, um, but yeah, it's also okay to break the standard rules of photography. Like it doesn't have to be the golden ratio. It doesn't have to be the rule of two thirds. You can, you can do whatever you want. It's, it's really up to you to be the, 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 the yeah, the decision, decision maker. So, um, so yeah, I think I, I have fun with that. And um, yeah, I like to feel rebel rebellious. So yeah, love it. But how did you get these effects? I'm curious. Yes. So these effects are with my lovely um, sparkle filter or star filter, and um, a star filter works really well with a hard source of light. So like if you have if you have sunlight, that will really work, work well. And like against, um, if it's shining against it, like a shiny piece of glass or metal or jewelry, um, you will get this starburst effect. And with um, with external flashes, the effect really comes out. So I love using um, star filters with with these flashes. I love the effect it gives, and it really adds like an extra dimension to your image. Um, so I use it quite often, actually. It's one of my favorites. And it's also kind of a vintage look too. Like they, they used it a lot in the 80s and I think the 70s. Um, and I love that these trends come back into, uh, into pop culture. And so, yeah, I love using it. I love it. That interior on the right is straight out of the 70s or 50s or 80s. So yes. bringing it all back yes. to life. It is just yeah. want to sit there. All right. And this is, and did you buy this as well? Did you find this vintage? Including like, how do you find your flash? Um, Like the star filter? Yes. Yes, I found it vintage actually. Yeah. And these, you can, you can really find these like for a good deals. There's like tons of them. Um, I found them at, uh, I went to like a, and a film photography fair here in the Netherlands. Um, 
and basically they have like boxes and boxes of these these filters and um yeah they're they're just basically they're practically giving them away i mean but um because for i think a long a long time nobody wanted them and um yeah because everyone was into digital photography for so long and you can get a lot of these you can get a lot of these effects on in photoshop but i mean there's almost nothing like making those effects yourself in camera i think it 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 makes the process so much more fun um at least for me so yeah i like to i like to go hunting for them like on uh yeah in these photography fairs or vintage shops or um secondhand shops as well love it okay um you can also use flash for freezing motion, um, like water or um, floating rocks. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever see so, it's an alien. Um, yeah, so I really like using flash for that um, uh, to help me freeze motion or like I, I've done it where like I throw like fabric into the air and um, yeah, it, it makes a really cool effect. It's just something fun to play around with, you know, just experiment with, with flash. And then for the next slide, um, you can also um, get motion blur effects. So that's kind of the opposite of freezing motion. You can get motion blur. Um, so if you shoot with a slow shutter speed, like anything under one sixtieth of a second, maybe like even going into like one eighth of a second or slower, um, you'll get a, um, so your flash will actually freeze the subject um, and you'll get a light trail beyond that. So it's, um, it's, it's another creative effect you can get. And then the next slide is about um, defined shadows. So um, the photo on the right, I shot the flash into a mirror and then the mirror is actually reflecting the, the light in an interesting way. Um, and you know, you can really play around with shadows with, with flash as well. It's, um, you can get creative effects that way. And in the next slide, I will show you some, um, gels so gels are like plastic different colored plastics which you can actually um like tape onto your flash head and it adds color to your scene and there's so many different things you can do with this i mean you can you can really create your own world with these colors and i love playing with these um my camera bag is like full of these accessories so i have i have gels always on me i have filters on me um you know different flashes so it sometimes becomes hard to to carry everything around but um yeah you guys you have to be prepared you know for the beauty um and then the next slide i wanted to just remind you that you can shoot in all weather conditions as well um the left is rain um the the one next to that is during like right after sunset into blue hour and blue hour is my favorite time to shoot after the sun goes down and the sky turns like pink and purple and this beautiful blues. Um, so I love to shoot, shoot during that time. Um, but you can also shoot shoot, uh, shoot during uh, when it's snowing and get like a bokeh effect. And even during broad daylight and that acts as like a fill in flash and then you get this, this the subject really pops. Um, so I love um, shooting in all different weather conditions. I wanted to bring everything back to just my, my career um, transition that I was talking about a bit earlier, which happened about two years ago or started to happen, should I say? Mm. And so, yeah, I was in this job where I was not feeling fulfilled. And um, I had a light bulb moment where I figured out that if I wanted the opportunity, I really needed to go out and, and make the work for myself. So I went during my lunch break and I um, I shot my creative stills of, of shoes in film because I was working for a company that sells sneakers and they had like a creative team. And um, 
I, I wanted to work in their studio. So um, I went back and after taking these photos, I um, asked the creative director there that, that, um, that worked there. I asked her if she wanted to, if she had time to meet and she did actually, she set aside time for me and we met and I just asked her like, I would love to have feedback on my portfolio. And what do you think of this project? Um, and I also said like, hey, I would love to shadow a photography shoot and just, um, yeah, just see how it works. My career aspirations are to be a photographer as well. And to my surprise, she, she said to me like, actually come on our next campaign and shoot product stills for us. And you can be the second photographer on, on the shoots. Um, so shout out to Linda, but, um, she like, this was really the beginning of my photography career. Um, and after a couple years, I started to work full-time in photography and that's what I'm up to now. And I think, um, by going through like all of these motions of revisiting old work and having inspirations and, you know, falling in love with flash and, and making mistakes along the way. I was able to get to this point and um, you know the opportunity that that Linda gave me was special to me because she she gave me this green light after I had heard no so many times but I mean I also learned that I had the power and the courage as well to like step up and ask for the opportunity so um, so yeah I, I hope this talk helps you to feel ready to go experiment, go get out there, use some flash and um, yeah, and explore your, your creative potential. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening. And it was a lot of fun to talk to you all.